All right, you guys, this episode of Paradigm Profiles is called House Cleaning on Blythe Street. Ezekiel Romo had been gone a long time. He went to prison in 1996. While he was there, he was groomed up and indoctrinated on Mexican Mafia politics and a radical belief system that he applied to every facet of his life. When he returned to Panorama City 18 years later, he didn't like what he saw. He told one of his older homeboys that it was time to clean house and take out the trash. However, he wasn't talking about pushing a vacuum cleaner or taking out the kitchen garbage. This was a metaphor that meant ridding his neighborhood of all the rivals, the DOs, the hermits, the trash, the informants, the dead weight, and the do-nothings that had been accumulating for years. This was an undertaking that had been addressed before in the past, but Romo made good on that promise. On Romo's orders, members of his gang, Blight Street, turned on and murked one another in a string of homicides that left eight dead. Romo used Blight Street to raise his own standing within the Mexican Mafia, the prison-based syndicate whose ranks he had hoped to join. He literally took the policies, procedures, and protocols of the Mexican Mafia and applied them to his neighborhood. He put members of his gang to work selling the Mexican Mafia's drugs, collecting their debts, and eliminating their enemies. Anyone who didn't comply or conform to the program was eliminated. If you could take one glimpse into Romo's mind and see how he was wired, it would create the portrait of a micromanager who knew just one response to petty slights and suspicions. Get an unsanctioned tattoo. Take care of it, Romo told his lieutenant. When the, when the lieutenant who dutifully orchestrated that murder and several more got strung out and stopped returning Romo's calls, it was his turn to go. And Romo didn't mind setting examples, regardless of what position the violator held. And if you had something Romo wanted, like a kilogram of cocaine, why pay for it? His dealer got the same treatment, a bullet in the back. Especially if you were within the perimeters of Blight Street. These were his stomping grounds, and there was no exception. And Romo had an intimidating presence, to say the least. He stood a towering 6'2", and he tipped the scales at a solid and chiseled up 230 pounds. But along with his size, he also exploited the biggest bully on the block mentality. Characteristics that he learned from some of the hardline MA leaders that he was around in prison. One of the things that Romo also emphatically believed in was equal responsibility. He couldn't stand do-nothings. If you were from the hood and you claimed to represent Blight Street, then you had to make as many sacrifices as everyone else, period. That meant putting in work, selling narcotics, and generating revenue for expansion. No exceptions. One might ask, why would you kill your own homeboys or other gang members from your hood? It was simple, and it was a matter of asserting dominance and control. Because in Romo's world, if you don't fit the mold and if you don't do what he wanted you to do, you got murked. Blight Street takes its name from a few blocks between Van Nuys Boulevard and Brimfield Avenue in Panorama City. Successions of police task force and anti-gang programs have never managed to shake its reputation as a drug market or weaken the gang's pool on generations of youngsters who grow up in the apartment complexes and who crowd one another behind tall metal fences. Members of Blight Street tend to use the same word to describe the gang. You feel like it's family. The gang literally adopts all the concepts of family and it's one big unit. From generation to generation, uncles, aunts, sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, they all embrace each other like one big family. Family functions in the park are always encouraged as it promotes unity amongst all the families as well. Barbecues, birthdays, quinceañeras, or regular get-togethers are promoted. This is all a part of protecting the family dynamic in your neighborhood too. This is why it's so hard to penetrate or infiltrate their circles. They all know each other, and in order to gain that trust, you have to know somebody. Some of the Blythe Street gang members were 12 or 13 when they joined, some even younger. And of course, most of the time their parents were absent or uninterested in their lives. The broken family dynamic is what's often sought after in the gang, the missing void that's found amongst peers. And that's what creates the unbreakable bond. Growing up in the gang element also fostered the criminal mindset as well. It just comes with the territory. They get used to taking risks and chances where others won't. Nobody has a job, nobody has monthly income, so you're robbing people, jacking cars, selling drugs. On any given night, you catch them hanging out in apartment complexes with names such as 
the Casitas, the Pinks, and Green Village. They locked themselves inside the laundry rooms to smoke methamphetamine, squat in vacant apartments, sell drugs in the parking lot, etc., etc. If a carload of rivals from gangs such as Columbus Street or Barrio Van Eyes pulled up, members of Blight Street vanished into the warren of hallways and stairwells. The night air crackled with the anticipation that gunfire might erupt from any oncoming car. But this was now Romo's domain, the street, the gang, the money to be wrung from the pushers and dispensaries and gambling parlors that operated within the gang's territory. All I ask is for complete control of Panorama City, he wrote in 2017 in a WhatsApp message from prison to an underling on the streets. But Romo's lawyer producing letters from his client's family, neighbors, and a former teacher pleaded with the judge not to write the young man off. I think that he's worth saving, judge. That's all I can say. Sentenced to 10 years for manslaughter, Romo would do 18 after being convicted of a 2007 assault on another inmate. When he got out in late 2014, Romo met with another older homeboy of Blight Street who testified at his trial in hopes of reducing a sentence for drug trafficking. In prison, Romo had worked under the Mexican Mafia. Blight Street never had much to do with the group, whose members were locked up in distant penitentiaries. But Romo changed all that. He brought it back to his neighborhood. The extent of their involvement was paying taxes, a few hundred dollars a month, which Blight Street came up by extorting Mexican nationals who sold crack and heroin in Panorama City. They just squeezed the paisas for that money. Some of the older Blight Street gang members say they remember a time when it was really just about the hood. It was about the neighborhood. It was about Blight Street. They didn't have much to do with Mexican Mafia politics. But Romo envisioned something different. The Mexican Mafia needed feet on the ground to realize schemes hatched from prison and he had the manpower. Working for three Mexican Mafia members, Frank Playboy Fernandez, Raul Huero Smooth Garcia, and Jose Cartoon Loza, Blight Street collected debts, moved drugs, and muscled in on those who needed persuading. Romo's thing was making things right for the M.A., doing bottles for them, taking care of people in the county jail. It sounded good, but a lot of violence came with all that. First, Romo needed to get his own house in order. He intended to purge the gang of dirty homeboys, informants, addicts, and dissenters. The charlatans and deadweight who often poisoned the younger homeboys and who spoke the gospel against the M.A. Blight Street gang members started turning up dead around 2015. After Romo had put all his players in position and was ready to start setting examples. And he knew the Mexican Mafia was watching. Rumors flew that they had not been killed by rivals. But that was just a smoke screen. Everybody knew the truth, but nobody spoke on it. No one went looking for revenge or tattooed the names of their dead on their bodies because they were the ones who knocked them down themselves. The funerals and the car washes put on to fund them were sparsely attended, some because of guilt and others because they were despised by them. The red flag should have been obvious, a kilo of cocaine, a setup. In a gray apartment complex off Blight Street, a dealer called Chiparro, Shorty, rented three units, one for his family, one for a girlfriend, and one where he cooked his dope. It was a safe house. Chaparro paid Romo every month for the privilege of selling it, but after he got raided and busted and caught a dope case, Chaparro fled to Mexico. Romo then arranged to buy a kilogram of cocaine from Chaparro's supplier, a Mexican national whom was only known as the Paisa. His name was Felipe Delgado. Romo took the cocaine, promising to return with the money in a week, and the Paisa trusted him based off of his relationship with Chaparro. Then, Romo started spreading word that Delgado was an informant, and of course, nobody doubted or questioned the story. Romo wanted to murk him because supposedly he was a rat, but at the same time, he had taken a kilo of cocaine. It was just a dirty way of getting rid of him without paying him back. These are the type of dirty cutthroat politics the Mexican Mafia devised all the time. And he kept that money. He never had no intention of paying. He kept it all for himself. Because Romo was on parole, he had a GPS monitor on his ankle. So Romo arranged for a young member of Blight Street, Steven Youngster Mendoza, to murk the paisa. The plan was for Romo to meet Youngster behind Chaparro's apartment complex. Romo would announce he was getting the money. Youngster would wait until Romo had walked out of sight before stepping out from behind the car and shooting the paisa. Romo believed his GPS monitor would show that he was in front of the building while the paisa was killed behind it giving him an alibi. 
the plan seemed plausible in his mind. However, putting himself in that close proximity would end up backfiring on him. To establish his own alibi, he went to his son's football game at Panorama High School. At 5.30 p.m. on November 6, 2015, the Paisa was shot three times in the back behind Chaparro's apartment complex. After the police helicopter could be seen flying over the football stadium, he knew where it was headed. And in his mind, this was confirmation that the hit had happened. Youngster was charged in the same case as Romo, but is yet to go to trial. Youngster has pleaded not guilty to murdering the Paisa. Two months after the Paisa's death, Romo was arrested with half a kilogram of methamphetamine in his car. He pleaded guilty and was shipped off to the Imperial County Desert to serve a four-year term at Sentinella State Prison. Ironically, Sentinella would just so happen to become the corporate headquarters for Blight Street. There, Romo had access to cell phones smuggled in by staff or dropped inside the walls using drones. A fellow Blight Street member who kept Romo abreast and updated on the neighborhood also kept him up to speed about the matter of Isidro Topo Alba. Once a leader of Blight Street himself, Topo was by then living out of his car, carving out a living by peddling methamphetamine and shaking down other dealers. He was out there playing a dangerous game, jacking other street dealers under the cloak of the Emmy. He said he was collecting the money on behalf of Mexican Mafia members in federal prison. But this seemed fishy, especially when it came to light that one of the MN members Topo claimed to be working for was actually deceased. Romo had warned Topo to stay out of Panorama City, but after he returned to prison, Topo started coming around again. A liquor store owner was complaining about being extorted. Cartoon, one of the Mexican Mafia members aligned with Romo, was facing trial on charges of gunning down another member, Dominic Solo Gonzalez. Topo had claimed to work for Solo. To bolster Cartoon's claim of self-defense, Romo wanted Topo to testify that Solo was violent. He recalled that Topo refused to jump in the hot chair saying, that sounds more like telling to me. The night of August 27, 2017, Topo was waiting outside of a Target in Van Nuys for a customer who wanted to trade a cell phone for methamphetamine. Sitting beside him in his Dodge Avenger, Topo's girlfriend noticed a black sedan driving past several times. Topo hesitated. Do you think this is a setup? Just hurry the fuck up, she told him, handing him the drugs from the glove box. Topo got out. The next thing she heard were shots. She saw Topo running back to the car, chased by two men in hooded sweatshirts. She identified them as Juan Flaco Ramirez and Jordine Little Goofy and Neri, both members of Blight Street. Flaco, whom she had known for years, was standing outside her window when he opened fire at point blank range. When the gunfire stopped and the shooters had fled, she ran into the street, raising both hands to flag down an oncoming car, according to a video played in court. Too late, she recognized the black sedan. Flaco and little Goofy stepped out along with the third man and shot at her again, she testified. She ran back to the car, laid down in the seat, and played dead. Topo was dead. He never had a chance to grab the 38 from the glove box. Little Goofy and Flacco have pleaded not guilty to murdering Topo and attempting to murder his girlfriend. They have yet to go to trial. This is not a game. Another man was in the black sedan that night. His name was Oscar Molina, but he went by Smokey. After Romo returned to prison, Smokey, a stocky Blight Street veteran, became his right hand man. You need feet out here, Smokey wrote to Romo on WhatsApp. Can't be in two places at once. If not, you probably would. Hundreds of messages exchanged between the two illustrated their relationship. Romo, the demanding boss. Smokey, the funny middle manager. On Christmas Eve 2017, Smokey typed out a long message. Don't let nothing change you, G. You're one of the few that I consider a good homie, a good camarada. So with that said, just know your boy will always be loyal and will always have your back as long as I'm around. Gracias for your words, Romo wrote back. They are a gift I accept more than money or shiny objects. The crimes that Romo and Smokey discussed span the state's penal code, collecting money from gambling parlors, extorting dispensaries, buying weapons at gun shows with fake IDs, obtaining drugs in Mexico and trafficking them out of state, killing an informant within Blight Street. The messages reveal Romo's view of his gang, an empire, himself a general, and his management style, some say I'm too hands-on. 
This was self-flattery at its best. But the one accolade that he obviously forgot was being security conscious. Because when his cell phone was confiscated during a routine search, he apparently didn't take the time out to delete all his old messages. And this was a costly mistake. Among the witnesses at Romo's trial was a man who considered Smokey an uncle, even if they weren't related by blood. Identified in the court records as witness two, he was the beneficiary of a remarkably lenient deal. Six years in custody for two murders, four years of which he would be allowed to serve under house arrest. Witness two testified that he and Smokey spoke with Romo over FaceTime almost every day, huddling in the bathroom of Smokey's apartment. During one meeting, Smokey told Romo that Carlos Rios, a Blythe Street hanger on, had gotten a tattoo without being jumped in, inducted through a beating. Nobody can have a B on his face without earning it, Romo said, according to Witness 2. This is not a game. He told Smokey to take care of Rios, Witness 2 testified, although he acknowledged Romo did not explicitly say to kill him. However, when you're out there dropping bodies and it hasn't been your standard to administer a beatdown, it's obvious what was indicated. Rios had grown up in the gang's territory and attended Panorama High School until the 11th grade when he was caught stealing a skateboard and sent to youth camp, said his sister, who declined to be named. She described Rios as a quiet kid, very private, who kept his family and friends separate. She recalled the day her brother came home after a 10-month stretch in county jail with a B tattooed on his left cheek. I was very upset, she said. Even before he went to jail, he'd been claiming to be part of the gang. She doubted it. That was a Wednesday. By Sunday morning, he was dead. The jury heard the following account of his death from witness two and one of the shooters, Santos Raider Martinez, who bragged to his cellmate in a recorded sting. Romo was mad that Panorama City was hot, that the block was burning up and had drawn the ire of the police. So Smokey, Raider, and his brother, Neftali Martinez, drove Rios to Van Nuys, telling him that they were going to graffiti a rival neighborhood. Rios started spray painting BST, Panorama City, Blythe Street, Raider told his cellmate. I tell him, keep on tagging. While he's tagging, I dome the idiot, meaning he shot him in the back of the head. But Rios was alive, even though Raider had emptied his gun's magazine into the 21-year-old. So, Neftali Martinez got out of the car, witness two testified, and finished him off. Prosecutors also charged Romo in the murders of three people killed in the long-running feud between the Black Street and Columbus Street gangs, arguing their deaths ensured he retained control of Panorama City's drug trade. The night of November 17, 2017, Alexis Saldana, pulled onto Blight Street with three other members of Columbus Street in his car, yelling, Fuck burros, Raider told his cellmate. Burro, Spanish for donkey, is a derogatory term for Blight Street. Raider said he chased them to a Wendy's, where he took this fool out. Shot in the back of the head, Saldana stepped on the gas and crashed into the restaurant. A month later, James Smiley Rodriguez, a Columbus Street gang member whom Smokey had warned to stay out of Panorama City, was shot to death outside of Denny's where Witness 2's wife waited tables. She testified that after the shooting, Raider told her, Pobre Pendejo, had been killed too. A poor bastard. Elvis Sanchez had been sitting next to Smiley on a bus when the shooting started. The 31-year-old delivery man who had nothing to do with gangs died on the sidewalk. Two more calabazas down, Smokey wrote to Romo the next day using an insulting term for Columbus Street. Everything worked out perfecto once again, and Smiley was one of them. Good to know, Romo wrote. Gracias, be safe. Hood, God, then family. According to Witness 2, Smokey had taken part in five murders. He collected Romo's money and carried out his orders, putting the gang above all else. For him, it was his hood. God, then family, Witness 2 said. His reward was four bullets in the back. Romo, at one point, would berate Smokey for not returning his calls. Don't worry about me. You stopped answering me. I'm cool. Won't bother you no more, he once told Smokey, who responded with a long apology. He was tired of them arguing over simple stuff, Smokey wrote. It seems like you find the reason to go off on me. And I know you do it for my own good. But you know, sometimes I'm not having a good day. Smokey was addicted to heroin and methamphetamine, Witness 2 said. Sometimes he'd shoot up while he was on FaceTime with Romo, the same way someone would just spark up a cigarette. 
and Romo never said nothing, but this turned him down. He's seen it as a weakness, despite the fact that he's seen a lot of reputable Mexican Mafia members indulging in hardcore drugs themselves. If you had an addiction to meth or heroin, he perceived you as untrustworthy and someone who wasn't on top of their game. So Smokey had been on borrowed time, he just didn't know it. There was only 24 hours in a day, money never sleeps, an irritated Romo told Smokey after several missed calls. He said he assumed Smokey had too much Halloween candy drugs. Around 4 a.m. on February 10, 2018, Smokey told a woman in his apartment that he would be right back, the coroner's report says. He tucked a revolver in his waistband, stepped out, and was shot in the doorway by his longtime friend, Eder Mendoza. Another Black Street gang member, Lorenzo Gonzalez, allegedly acted as the lookout. Witness 2 testified that Romo told him Smokey was killed because he'd owed people money. He'd been caught lying, and he was getting way, way too high. But in all actuality, it all came down to Romo not liking the fact that Smokey had challenged and undermined him one too many times. Not only that, but Romo also took insubordination on any level as an affront to his own ego. Twelve days later, Mendoza and Gonzalez picked up Karen Tobar in an unlicensed taxi called a bandit cab. Tobar was the woman who had been in Smokey's apartment the night he was killed. Her body was found in a Silmar Park the next morning, stabbed 60 times. They took her for a one-way walk into that park because they obviously believed she was going to tell the cops what she knew about Smokey's demise. In fact, word on the streets was that she might have already talked to investigators who were asking questions. And despite the mounting evidence against them both, they pled not guilty to charges of murdering Smokey and Tobar. In his closing argument in the ninth floor courtroom of the downtown criminal courts building, Romo's attorney, Jerome Haig, said the prosecution's witnesses were lying when they cast him as this big leader of this gang who micromanages everyone. He emphatically tried downplaying Romo and his role as just another small time gang member wannabe who was trying to run his neighborhood like a military base boot camp. Haig painted a picture of Romo as a substandard gang banger who went to prison and became fixated and consumed with how the Mexican Mafia operated. From the start of their investigation, he argued, the police wanted to tie every gang killing in Panorama City to Romo, no matter how thin the evidence. Unfortunately for Romo, the jurors didn't buy it. After deliberating for nine days, they not only convicted Romo of the murders he was alleged to have ordered, but they also found him liable for the killings of Columbus Street gang members. He faces life in prison without parole. After the verdict, Haig took the view that Romo was trying to make the gang more powerful as an enterprise, not as far as killing people. He noted that Romo's messages with Smokey discussed selling drugs, acquiring guns, and making money, but none of the murders he was said to have ordered. Making that argument to the jury, though, was a difficult needle to thread. I tried to make the jury think and think hard about their obligations, Haig would later say. And I think they did, even if they didn't come back our way. Raider, who fell asleep as his attorney pleaded with the jury to acquit him, was convicted of the four murders. The panel found his brother guilty of murdering Rios. While Neftali Martinez was acquitted of Saldana's murder, he was found guilty of conspiring to commit the crime. William Smokes Benitez, who looked like the third participant in Topo's shooting, according to Topo's girlfriend, was acquitted of that murder. The jury hung 9-3 in favor of acquittal on the charge that Smokes, along with Raider, murdered Smiley and Sanchez outside the Denny's, said his lawyer, Joel Corey. Smokes was nonetheless convicted of conspiring to commit those murders, meaning he faces 50 years to life in prison, Corey said. The way the law is written, there is no limit to liability. Because he's a gang member, he's responsible for everything the gang does. This is called using predicate offenses. Corey said in casting so broad a net, the state's gang conspiracy law fails to consider that people join gangs for different reasons and get involved to varying degrees. Since the jury rejected that he was a shooter, what was Smoke's role in the conspiracy? He got high with the gang, Corey said. It was never made clear during the trial whether Romo got what he wanted. While Haig said he has no status in the Mexican Mafia, the word on the street is Romo is now a senor a term of respect for a Mexican Mafia member. On a recent evening, Blight Street was quiet. So many of its members are in jail or dead. 
Perhaps Romo said it best when he texted Smokey six weeks before he was murdered. You can judge a real man's worth by the success of those around him. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. I'm going to start putting out a lot more of these types of small stories. The way I used to put profiles out. I'm still going to continue doing the Mexican Mafia stories as well as some of the other stories I've been putting out. So just look for a diversity of content will be dropping. Also, I'm aware of the fact that some of the editing has been bad. But rest assured, it's something we're working on. And last but not least, for those of you who are asking how to submit questions for the Q&As, just drop your questions anywhere in the comments and we'll find them. Anyways, if you guys like this story, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, give it a thumbs down. Either way, drop a comment and let me know what you think. With that said, this is your boy B and I'm out.